All right, it's my pleasure to get us started for uh, the last section of our conference. It's been a pleasure to really span uh, a lot of different disciplines, a lot of different ideas, and this last section is going to give us two opportunities. One, to kind of come full circle back to another one of the fathers of green chemistry, and also to come full circle and have a discussion. So we're going to start the afternoon with a presentation by John Warner, and it's my sincerest uh, pleasure and honor to introduce John Warner back to UC Berkeley uh, for the second time. I first invited uh, John Warner to come speak at UC Berkeley in 2009, um, the very first, no, 2008, the very first year that we held a graduate student symposium in green chemistry and sustainable design. And he and his talk that afternoon went a long way to start helping chemists understand that we need to think more broadly about chemical design. John comes from uh, an academic background, a very uh, prestigious academic background, um, and found that even within the freedom of academics, he wasn't able to do as much innovation as he wanted. And that's what led him in 2007 to start his own institute, the Warner Babcock Institute, to really pursue these ideas of green chemistry, make them real on a full-time basis, and work with companies that want to make these things happen, to do all of the things that we've been talking about previously throughout the day. It's also my pleasure to introduce him because he's a great example of what I've found the green chemistry community to be very welcoming, opening, uh, open, and willing to mentor young people. So I just got my start. I didn't know anything about green chemistry. And people like John Warner, Paul Anastas, and others were willing to meet with me as a graduate student, to come at our invitation to UC Berkeley. It's that sort of support from our mentors that gives us the courage and the desire to take on big problems. So all of you out there who have students who email you and ask you questions, be sure to take the time, because when you take the time, it can really pay off, and you can end up in a place like this. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome John Warner. Oh, well, thank you. Gosh, I don't even know what to say now. There's so much has already been said. Uh, we've had so many amazing talks talking about his, so many different things. I don't know if there's anything else I can add to you, so I was just going to sing a little bit, um, <laughs> which you don't want me to do, actually. Um, thank you, Marty. I, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I sincerely believe that this is a pivotal moment in the evolution of the field of green chemistry. I think if you look around the world, if you look at there are several centers for green chemistry spattered around the planet. There are, I would say, probably at almost every college and university in the United States, there is a minimum of one or two professors that identify themselves now as doing green chemistry. I think that you can find pockets of it in, in chemistry departments all over the place. K-12 education is beginning to embrace it. And you have a little bit of it over here doing something, a little bit over here. But here at Berkeley, you got it all. And here at Berkeley, you've got the work of Mike Wilson. You've got the uh, work of all the people working in, in, his, in his family that are discussing the, the, the front line of toxicology, the front line of environmental health, understanding what are the things that we should be looking out for, understanding how to organize society to anticipate that harm. And then you've got the chemistry department. And the chemistry department has embraced it with, with the faculty, with Marty's work, doing it at the molecular level, pouring the beakers and flasking, embracing this as one of the, the, the most worthwhile of, of academic and intellectual pursuits. There are places that are doing little of one and doing a little of the other. This is the only place that's doing it all. And I tip my hat to the center and to the people here that are doing it. And I just think it's fantastic. And in a way, this is what innovation truly is about, is innovation at the intersection of very disparate fields, okay? It's very easy, you know, people were saying before, well, a, a synthetic chemist, you know, collaborated with a physical chemist and called that some kind of interdisciplinary rhetoric, you know? 
Uh, well, maybe a chemist works with a biologist. Ooh, that's stretching. Um, but I'm, I'm going to end pushing, pushing this a little bit more, so, 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 so bear with me a little bit. Um, but I, I want to be provocative. I want to say things that haven't been said before. And I also want to restate some of the things just to make sure that we're all on the same page and thinking the same things. You know, a long time ago now, it feels like it was probably a, a million years ago, um, CNE News was probably in the, in the mid-90s. I, ha I was the guest editorial for CNE News, and I titled my guest editorial Asking the Right Questions. And here it is now, ooh, 15 years later, and I'm still wondering if we're asking the same questions. Maybe this is the right question, and I'm done. Um, but um, why would a chemist make a hazardous material. It is so easy, philosophically, emotionally, to go down the spiral path of an epic battle of good and evil. That there are good forces in the world and there are evil forces in the world and anyone who doesn't agree with me must be on the dark side and anyone who does agree with me is enlightened. Okay? Everyone can't be right with that perspective. Uh, and I think that here at Berkeley, we're starting to address that fundamental intersection of good and evil. It ain't about good and evil. It's about fundamental knowledge and the lack of fundamental knowledge. And so instead of thinking about how we make materials, how do we train chemists? How do we train the future generation of scientists in general? And look at this not as, obviously there are moral and ethical implications of what we do but it's still a science and a technology that we pursue. And it is the tools of science and technology that will achieve moral and ethical goals. But the goals and the processes, when they start to bump into each other, it gets a little gooey. We've got to be real careful about that. My background is academic. I, I went to Princeton, became a medicinal chemist, got a bunch of publications on this drug that's now called Olympta. Uh, wonderful human being, Ted Taylor, I worked with. Um, Eli Lilly now, this is the most successful anti-cancer drug for solid tumors in the history of medicinal chemistry. I played a tiny little role in that and really actually expected to go into academia as a medicinal <laughs> chemist. And before I graduated, the Polaroid Corporation called me up in my lab and offered me a job to, to head exploratory research at Polaroid before I graduated. I said to the, the person, I said, Dude, I'm a medicinal chemist. I'm going into academia. He told me what he was going to pay me for a salary. I said, when do I start? And the next thing you know, I found I'm an industrial chemist. <laughs> what would a medicinal chemist do at a place like Polaroid? I was given this beautiful group of people, imaginative group of people. It was kind of cool. At the time, Polaroid had you know, its research and development group, probably about 300 strong in eastern Massachusetts, I worked directly to a senior vice president, was given a little group of, of 10 people and said, work on whatever project you think is a good thing to work on. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to find a way of doing cutting edge, really cool science, but I also, just too fundamentally practical, I wanted to solve problems today. And so I went to the vice president of manufacturing and I said, with the resources I have available, how can I help you today? And one thing led to another, and I came up with this concept called non-covalent derivatization. Will not kill you on this, but I am the world's biggest nerd. The license plate of my car is NCD for non-covalent derivatization. <laughs> <laughs> so I can go on and on and on about this. But there are, there are now, it's interesting, I, I, I started publishing about this. It was interesting. At, while I was a graduate student at Princeton, I worked for Ted Taylor, but I became very good friends with Andy Hamilton. And Andy Hamilton at that time was into molecular recognition and self-assembly. So, and I was, you know, one of these, you know, mid midnight, you know, insomniacs that would go on the vax to do molecular modeling at 2 a.m. And so I started to publish with other professors on modeling and, and how hydrogen bonding and, and different things that are similar to, 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 to a natural phenomenon would define molecular structure. So I started really early on doing that. And then at Polaroid, started to look at how can I look at that in a manufacturing process? If you think about it, and Paul alluded to this earlier this morning, we've had what we call chemistry for about 150 years. All right? 
we make elegant, beautiful, wonderful molecules. But if you think about it, we use high temperature, we use high pressure, and we use very strange environments to have these things happen. And I would argue that nature outperforms us hands down in diversity and complexity, but does it at room temperature, at ambient pressure, using for the most part water as a solvent. It's only recently that great scientists are starting to be able to do this and get Nobel Prizes over it, and being surprised to be told that they do green chemistry. Um, this is, it's, it's, the frontier is to learn from nature and to emulate nature. Um, but, and so now, these little crazy ideas I had, now there's journals, crystal engineering, crystal growth and divine. The, the field has evolved uh, a bit, but it started back in the late 80s with this weird technology that the photographic industry actually calls Warner complexes, in which what I did was I took a, an assembly of molecules in the formulation process. Instead of making a multi methyl ethyl propyl butyl futyl molecule, I did, instead, I took two simple molecules, put them in an aqueous environment, and allowed them to self-assemble and form a crystal. And by controlling the crystal forces, much like nature, I could then dictate precisely the dissolution kinetics. Okay, and I call this non-covalent derivatization, and it worked. Next thing you know, Polaroid is going to large-scale manufacturing. We had to get EPA approval. We had to get what Lynn pointed out, low volume exemption, pre-manufacturing notifications. Well, I sent all this paperwork. This was back before email and stuff. Stack of paperwork this big, sent it down to DC, waited and waited and waited, and ended up having a little bit of a struggle. They, it wasn't that it was toxic or anything like that. They were saying, small particles, what are you talking about? Molecular complexes, are you high? They had no idea what I was talking about. And so I was invited to go to EPA and give them a seminar on non-covalent derivatization. Well, when I got to the EPA, I was a little bit nervous, I was a little bit scared, or very, very intimidated, and I get this, I'm clutching my overhead transparencies, and I go and I, <laughs> very heavy overhead transparencies, and I go and I see the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics dude, this guy, Paul Anastas. Okay, I know this guy. I've known him since I was 11 years old. I was playing in a jazz band with his older brother. <laughs> <laughs> So his older, his older brother there is playing the saxophone, there's me on the keyboard. My older brother was awesome hair playing the trumpet. Uh, and so, you know, we, we knew each other really well. And I said, wait a minute. Polaroid used to have a multi-step synthesis using all these solvents, all these reagents, all this nasty. I've come up with a one-step, non-toxic, aqueous process. Old technology bad, new technology good. Why am I at the EPA begging your permission to do something that you should be singing and dancing? And Lynn alluded to this, that it's very difficult to do something new the way the process is. The old embedded technologies are easier to propagate than to come up with something new. Well, Paul was working with a group of people at the EPA at the time, and there was a bunch of different programs, and he was just starting this nascent thing called green chemistry. We realized this is an industrial example of green chemistry. And one thing led to another, and we hit it off about green chemistry. We started defining it. We wrote this book. I tell you, this book is an amazing thing. Had I thought anyone was ever going to read this book, we would have written a better book. But um, <laughs> this thing, it, I turned into Forrest Gump almost immediately. This thing gets translated into all these, these languages. I find myself going and meeting presidents and prime ministers and talking. It's a swell book, but um, <laughs> there's really only a couple pages that are really, really good, and, and that's my favorite, <laughs> okay? And the reason that this is the favorite, and this is really important, I'll come back to this a few times throughout this discussion, the reason that this is, this is so important to me is because this goes from a, um, what do we call, a, I, I, I like to talk about sustainability gurus. People who just say, it would be nice if we did this. It would be nice if we did this. Green chemistry is, well, this is how you do it, okay? And so the 12 principles of green chemistry, much more humble, much more modest. They aren't, they aren't these grandiose things. They're really just, you roll up your sleeves, this is how you do green chemistry. If you want to make something that's more compliant with regulations, if you want to make something that's more safe, well, this is a pretty good checklist to go through. That's it. It's not really that grandiose. And as Paul mentioned before, it's kind of obvious. It's just we don't really think about it all that much. So at this point in time now, I'd already started 
the field of green chemistry, I wrote the book, was into this. You know, there, there was a side personal story that you know, I'm not going to go into in great depth. I was, like, I was very successful as a chemist. I was on the cover of Celebrity Magazine as Boston's best and brightest you know, graduating senior. Princeton gave me all these pats on the head. I got inventor awards for all my patents. At this point in time, I probably synthesized about 2,500 new compounds that had never existed before. I was pretty prolific as an organic chemist. Really on the top of my game. And I lost my two-year-old son to a breast defect. My son John was born with a disease called biliary atresia, in which his, small, his intestines were completely disconnected to his liver. There's no way for him to process water and soluble nutrients. He was given some surgery to keep him alive, and after two years, you know, finally we, we lost him. Um, just this um, holiday season, my 21-year-old son was shown, was rushed to the hospital to have emergency surgery. He has a much lesser form, but he actually has the same breast defect. Um, no one knows the cause of this. For all I know, it's a neonatal virus. It could be anything. But lying awake at night, at my, after the evening of my son's funeral, staring at the ceiling saying, you know, I've synthesized 2,500 compounds. Never was taught what makes a chemical toxic. What makes, I have no idea what makes a chemical an environmental hazard. How could I be such a successful scientist, having synthesized so many things, never had this toxic, you know, know nothing about this field? Now again, I don't believe you know, really that it was something that I interacted with. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But the point is I have no clue. All right? I'm familiar with things like chemists have higher incidence of certain types of tumor. I've heard about elevated breast cancer mortality among professional chemists. I've heard these kinds of things vaguely, but four years of undergraduate, three and a half years of graduate school, and I never had a course, I never had a seminar, never had a discussion. How is it possible that I could be so successful in this big part of it with absent? In 2008, it's the latest numbers, we graduated in the United States, 13,000 undergraduates, 2,000 masters, and 2,300 doctorals in, in, in chemistry. In 2004, for the first time in history, more women became chemists than men. What could be more important to the field of chemistry than an understanding of toxicity and reproductive hazards? But it's absent. To get a degree in chemistry, not one university on the planet requires any demonstration of knowledge of re regarding toxicity and environmental impact. Yes, we have litigation prevention classes. How do you label your waste? How do you wear the gloves? And what do you do to make sure that you know, we've done everything that's compliant? But a fundamental understanding of what makes a molecule toxic eludes us. CPT, the American Chemical Society, I've been on various boards and things for 15 years. We've just released in 2008 the latest version of the guidelines of what all undergraduates should have if they learn chemistry. We require calculus, biochemistry, instrumentation, independent work. Not any mention of toxicology, environmental impact, sustainability, law and policy. Huh. So after 10 years of working in industry, I said, I want to I try to change this. And so Polaroid was just so cool, they gave me hundreds of thousands of dollars of instrumentation. I went and I became a professor at the UMass system. And I started a PhD program in green chemistry. My model was, innovation is a funny thing. You know, big companies exist, but the, big pa the, the typical pathway to innovation is a small startup company comes up with a new technology, then through merger and acquisition, that becomes brought, brought into a bigger industry. So I said, instead of saying, oh, I'm going to change chemistry and be that presumptuous, I said, I'm going to just start another PhD. I'll call it green chemistry. And maybe people say, hey, that's kind of cool. And slowly it'll be merged and inquired into chemistry departments and hopefully go away. Okay, I don't want green chemistry to be around forever. It needs to just vanish and become part of what chemists do. And so that's my model. And so we started this PhD program. It became really, really successful. But I said, you know, there's a lot of people out explaining the moral and ethical components. Let's really put a different perspective to it. So sustainability is a big field. Right? You can talk about economics, agriculture, education, business, chemistry, engineering, all kinds of different ways of slicing up this thing we call sustainability. The subset that we call sustainable chemistry has a whole bunch of ways of looking at that. 
policy, remediation technologies, exposure control, green chemistry, water purification. You can think of a million different ways of slicing this up. Green chemistry isn't a be-all, end-all. It is a subsection of the bigger thing called sustainable chemistry. It is the solvents, the catalysts, the renewable feedstocks, the toxicity. It is the subset. It is application agnostic. It is the building blocks by which we create our applications. It is the fundamental basic chemistry. Okay, now, instead of remembering all that thing, I've got a good idea. Let's just give them numbers 1 through 12. Uh, but a <laughs> little biased there. But, um, so, so, so that's how green chemistry fits into sustainable chemistry. Again, it has been pointed out before, you can have a solar energy panel using toxic materials. Now, that doesn't mean solar energy isn't crucial. It doesn't mean that people working on solar energy aren't doing the most important thing in the world. We've got to remember, the enemy of the excellent is the perfect. All right? Chemistry has been around for 150 years. We've just been thinking about this for a little bit more than a decade. It is going to take 50, 60, 70 years to do significant impact on the way we do things. This is not something we're going to snap our fingers and be green tomorrow. It's going to take an enormous amount of effort, an enormous amount of time. We've got to recognize that incremental improvement is the way that it works. It doesn't work through, you know, people like to think of it as a revolution, but we didn't get to where we are today in chemistry from revolutions. We got it from incremental advances. Someone does this, someone does that. And that's the same thing with green chemistry is we just got to look at some, some group somewhere in the world is looking at principle number nine in certain systems. Another group is looking at principle number three in certain systems. Over the decades, they will merge and we'll start to get a body of knowledge where we can really do some serious things. The great news is, is from an economic perspective, until that happens, early adopters have a massive competitive advantage in a changing global economy. So that's the, that's the cool thing, is that the future is everyone's going to do it someday. The cool thing is that they're not doing it today, so those who do it first are first in line. So they get to, they get to define what that future sustainability is. So the way I look at it, of all the products and processes that we have in our society, maybe 10% would escape some scrutiny. Now, I'm not saying I agree with all the scrutiny, but somewhere somebody is gunning for 90% of everything out there. Maybe it's not from a renewable feedstock. Maybe it uses a lot of energy. Maybe it has a sol solvent or something wrong. There's about 90% of the stuff. There's somebody has got a beef about it. All right? This thing called alternatives assessment, where you go and you Google up and you try to find a technology that might suit your needs, I would say that maybe 25% of the time that's going to be successful. 25% of the time, there may be some alternative out there. But right now in 2011, I'm saying about 65% still haven't been invented. Now, you could look at this in despair and say, oh, my God, 65% haven't been invented. Or you could say, what better time in the history of humanity to be a chemist and have such important work in front of us? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't every kid want to line up and be a chemist and be part of not only having a good job, not only having the most intellectually challenging thing you can imagine doing, and saving the world at the same time. What are we doing wrong with our messaging? But that ain't happening. So you ask yourself, where do the products come from? They don't just pop up out of thin air. Molecules, we turn into materials, we call that basic research. Materials we turn into components, we call that applied research. Uh, you know, components you know, get turned into devices, we call that development. When we make a bunch of them, we call it manufacturing. What do we do when we, how, how do we, what's our report card if we do this well? Well, we worry about performance, we worry about cost, we worry about the social implications. Green chemistry is all of that. Okay, because again, of course, this isn't a straight line. You know, the, you know you've got the environment in the middle. You can ask yourself, where did the molecules come from depleting renewable feedstocks? At the end of its life, did the product you know, de you know, degrade into innocuous byproducts, or do they persist? Who is in the best position to mitigate all those implications? The chemist who designs it in the first place. And in the future, those chemists are going to understand mechanistic toxicology, environmental implications, and they'll be able to participate at a level that they weren't able to do before. That's the dream, that's the hope of green chemistry, because it's those implications that we can do. It's not that we can't do it. We can do it, because advances in the field of mechanistic toxicology are just happening now, in the last 10 years. They haven't been happening over the decades, and so it's just now that we can actually start working and interacting and collaborating with that field. 
Now, it's different than policy, okay? And, 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 I, and I know I'm a broken record, and particularly here in California, there's a lot of history about this. I salute the chemical policy work that's going on in California. There is, I, I will stand beside everything that, 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 that people are doing in chemicals policy. I think it's critical. It is the supply side, it's the demand side of green chemistry. It is creating that demand. And green chemistry and green engineering are creating the supply. The two go hand in hand. They aren't the same thing, but they are absolutely interrelated. And so I created a couple slides, and you're going to bear with me with this. After Anastas used a few of my slides that I usually use, I go, oh God, what am I going to do? So I sat back there and I created some new slides just today. So I hope that these work. Okay? So I honestly believe that industrial innovation is driven by cost and performance. Tongue in cheek, I always say, oh, and there's also the environment. But I don't entirely agree with that. I, I use it as an illustrative example, but I don't really believe in it. Because if you think about it, marketing in the evolution of the market is saying that environment is a performance issue. So it's not something separate. And in, in chemicals laws and policies actually address the cost. Okay, so really what you have is marketing and, and, and awareness of product implications, regulations, laws and policies on this side, that slowly, it really comes back down to cost and performance. So in this interim, we have this thing called green chemistry, but really chemistry responds to all the needs of society. And it just so happens right now at this point in our evolution of humanity, this is, the, this is on the radar screen. But it's not very much different than when polymers were invented. It's not very different than when nanotech started coming. You know, these, these, these mountaintops of, of chemical exploration, they vary, and some have that moral and ethical components to them, some don't. But when you get down to the beakers and flasks, the molecules don't really care. And, and when you look at it as a fundamental molecular challenge, it's really what it's all about. All right. So when you look at the 12 principles of green chemistry, there's two perspectives to look at them. Marketing, you can get a couple of the 12 principles if you're into the marketing, you want to put a big shiny badge on your shoulder saying, I do green chemistry. That's really not where green chemistry is at. Green chemistry is designed to be in the R&D phase. It isn't really the, the, the marketing stuff. And so sometimes I get a little bit worried about, you know, there are other ways of, of measuring sustainability of products. Bless you. Green chemistry was designed to be into the, the R&D stuff of things. And so I have this golf metaphor. Now, if anyone ever saw me golf, you would know that I should never give a golf metaphor. My wife is an amazing golfer, and she just looks at me and shakes her head. But I'm going to go with it anyways. All right? She's shaking her head. Um, imagine you've got a bunch of golfers together, and you line them up. And you want to say, okay, let's evaluate the golfer's game. Okay, ooh, not that way. How far does the golfers drive? How straight do they hit? How accurate is the short game? You know, can they get out of traps? Okay, you could measure these things and you could quantify those things. And you say, on any given day, this golfer's going to come in first, this one's going to go in second, this one's going to come in third. Swell. Many of our environmental performance, sustainability things are kind of like that, all right? You got different ways. How consistent is the golfer, okay? But what if you want to do better? If you want to do better, you don't go to the golfer and say, drive farther. It probably ain't going to work. Amy's tried, okay? It doesn't work. <laughs> you, know, um, you go back to the basics, and you talk about not the measurable attributes, but how do they grip the club? How do they hold their shoulders? How does the golfer place their feet? All these fundamental things that are adjustable components of the game, but they don't make the bumper stickers. Okay, you're not going to get, oh, oh. Tiger Woods had the greatest grip. So we won't go there. Um, but but um, you know what I mean? It's, it, it's, it's a little bit suppressed. So the way that I look at it is a chemist can be a phenomenal chemist and never really acknowledge E1 mechanisms, E2 mechanisms, SN1. We learn all this stuff about solvent effects, about mechanistic interpretations of things. Some chemists just kind of forget that and are phenomenally successful in the lab doing things. But I would argue the ones that do remember that stuff do it a lot better. Can you do green chemistry and not know the 12 principles? Of course you can. Right? But if you think of the 12 principles, of the underlying grip, shoulders, all that stuff there, you just do it better. And so that's kind of, so once you transcend from a litany of what you should and shouldn't do to an intuitive understanding 
you go from encyclopedic knowledge to creative knowledge. All right, and this is a big subject I could go on and on and on about how I believe that our education system is focusing too much on encyclopedic knowledge at the expense of creative knowledge and we're suffering from an innovative perspective. But that's kind of buried in all of this, but that's of another day. But here's the point. Green chemistry, I refuse to accept that green chemistry is some birth of ethics. The people that I worked with throughout my life before green chemistry was ever uttered from anyone's lips were as moral and ethical as anyone else in this room. We love our children, we love our environment, and nobody wakes up in the morning and says, screw it, I'm just going to make the world a worthless place. Right? We, that's just not the way it works. All right? What green chemistry is is merely a shifting of our relationship to the environment. What we've always done when I was a student, I was trained. I wear gloves to protect my skin. I wear masks to protect my lung. I wear glasses to protect my eyes. We install scrubbers and filters and smokestacks to protect the air, the land, and the sea. We care about human health and the environment, and we will protect it through Herculean efforts of engineering and exposure control. The revolution that is green chemistry is saying, well, let's shift a little bit from the exposure component to the intrinsic hazard and add to the criteria of the fundamental inventive chemist the criteria of intrinsic hazard. We can't snap our fingers and say so that we never need exposure control ever again. I will not live to see that day. But that doesn't mean I don't want that day to happen. So the dream of green chemistry is that we're so good in the chemistry lab, we learned so much about environmental and toxicological models that there is a dream that someday in the future we don't need exposure controls because if a tanker truck is screaming through your, 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 your neighborhood, hits a bump and tips over, Everyone gets a broom, all right? And that's the dream, is to have the, 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 the materials inherently safe. We're far from that. And it's going to take a long time, but that's, the, that's what's happening here at the center at Berkeley, is bringing in the people that understand hazard and, under, and the people that understand how to make molecules and putting them in the same room and saying, let's roll up our sleeves and change the world. That's pretty cool. All right? And obviously I can go through and bore you all with the economic discussions about how, how much more expensive it is to use a hazardous material. Okay, if, if I have a hazardous material here and I have a safe material here, it costs a whole lot more to store. I think Jerry could tell us a lot about transportation issues, treatment issues, disposal, regulatory costs, liability, worker health and safety, corporate reputation, community relations, new employees. Oh you know, my God. It kind of goes on and on and on. Who in their right mind wouldn't want. If my definition of green chemistry is superior performance, superior cost, and environmentally benign, and that is the requirement, then who wouldn't want it? So my premise is that, therefore, no one discards it. It just hasn't been invented yet. And once you recognize and accept that most of the problems here just haven't been invented, and it is a cause to invent, puts us in a different space, and it gets us away from the epic battle of good and evil. Okay? And so my dad was an electrician. We grew up, you know, we had a toolbox everywhere. You know, it seems, seems that we went in the kitchen. My mother had either toolboxes, spoons, and knives. We had toolboxes in the basement, out in the garage. My toys were in toolboxes. You know, and so I grew up with this, toy, this toolbox mentality. You know, the chemical industries have a toolbox. There are 822 different ways of making carbon-carbon bond reactions, 127 oxidation reactions, 96 reduction reactions. We've got a lot of tool, tools. We've evolved in Herculean efforts of amazing people who have done all kinds of different things. If we can draw a molecule and it doesn't violate some fundamental rule, given enough resources, we could probably synthesize it ultimately. All right? However, if you imagine a green chemistry toolbox, that has all those same synthetic transformations that have minimal impact on the human health and the environment, like I said, I would argue that that toolbox is 90% empty. And that is the opportunity that we have, is to slowly and surely fill out systematically this toolbox and find out what the biggest needs are, what the biggest gaps are, and start solving these problems. Okay? This is a, you know, I, I've been attempting, I'm a synthetic organic chemist. Most of what I do is synthetic organic chemistry. And I've been trying to go into the world of, of toxicology. I am a medicinal chemist. I teach mechanistic toxicology. There are some papers that I've published, if anyone is interested, in how to speak to the synthetic organic chemist, how to look at you know, different, different things, mechanisms of action, QSAR relationships, bioavailability, pharmacokinetics, in the design of molecules at the lab stage. 
anyone's interested, I can point them in these directions to actually, because for, this, for the field to grow, we have to pursue it at a higher intellectual level, not only doing it, but thinking about how we do it. Okay, and so that is a desperate need, and that is the, the direct intersection of chemistry and environmental health, is coming up with these kinds of decision trees to help, because again, we don't want, right now, all we really have is list-based design criteria. Here is a list of bad molecules you shouldn't do. Here is a list of good solvents you should use. Here is a list of this. Here is a list of that. And as I said before, that is getting onto that weird world of encyclopedic knowledge. And encyclopedic knowledge is not creative knowledge. We have to get this embraced into the heart of the chemist as an intuitive thing that they can look at the group and say, okay, if I got a methyl group over here and a carbonyl group over here, it's probably going to be you know, hitting this receptor. And we don't want everyone to become junior toxicologists. We just want them to be able to understand the language. So my dream is a one semester course in mechanistic toxicology. That's it. If every chemist had to take a one semester course in mechanistic toxicology, just enough to learn the language so that they could communicate with the Lynn Goldmans and the Mike Wilsons and the people that are developing these models and be able to translate what is being learned in the world in their lab. Not to become toxicologists, but to be able to pursue knowledge in that direction when they need to. But problems can't be solved at the same level of awareness it creates. And obviously, that's a, a wonderful Einstein quote. And so after 10 years of academia, I was chair of the chemistry department, I was a professor of community health and sustainability, I was a professor in the plastics engineering department. I had a wonderful group of students and everything. I decided that I had limited credibility going to industry saying, you should do green chemistry. You know, full tenured professor, state of Massachusetts, I could commit a felony. I'm not going to lose my job. Um, and so I did a really stupid thing, and I gave it all up, and I started my own company. With, with people in this room that helped me, you know, introduce me to Jim Babcock and Bill Kunzweil, and I started the Wanna Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry in the Beyond Benign Foundation. Wanna Babcock Institute's Beakers and Flask Research Institute. Beyond Benign is uh, outreach and education run by my wife, Amy. Uh, and in 2007, I just said, if I can make a go at this, take no government money, just work with industry, play by the rules of industry. If I can be successful at that, who's going to tell me I'm crazy? Well, that's it, but you know what I mean. So a little bit north of, a little bit north of Boston in Wilmington, Mass, a 42,000 square foot facility in which I've got a, we've doubled in size the first three years. We're up to 40 scientists working in the, I got to tell you, Every instrument I've ever touched in my life, I have in this institute. We work by, by rapid, rapid, the, someone makes a molecule, creates a device, tests the device, and then the same day is synthesizing the molecule. The teams do everything together. Synthesis, engineering, design, evaluation. And it allows us to, we don't send out for anything, everything under one roof so that we do things in just ridiculously fast modes. But what's really important is in the bottom, right in the middle of all of this, is a learning center. When I was a professor at UMass, at any given time, I had about 35 people in my lab. I was really successful at getting funding, and I had postdocs and graduate students, and I had a rule. Anyone working in my lab, no matter who they were, had to twice a month go to a third grade class, a sixth grade class, and translate their research to the K-12 community to get them to understand how that works. I, and, and I thought that was really important. So when I started this, Amy agreed to keep that going here. And it has K through 12, community, workforce <laughs> development, and all kinds of tools that hopefully we're going to be collaborating quite a bit with, with Berkeley so that they don't have to reinvent much of this stuff. We have this thing called the Green Chemistry Commitment. And I want to talk more with, with people about this, seeing if we can have a five-year plan to get many of the chemistry departments in the country to follow Berkeley's lead and start to introduce, introduce into the curriculum green chemistry, not just talk about it, but show how it's creating systemic change. But this is what scares me the most. At the very time we need more people inventing materials, we got less. There's a very steady decline. This is out of science about a, half a year ago, showing U.S. citizens getting PhDs in chemistry. We've got to really think about that. And so I told you I was going to talk about collaboration in a different way at the end here. If we think about how children grow up, you know, kid is born, around two years old, one year old, they start babbling and drooling and things like that. At four years old, they start to show interest. And very early on, we in society pigeonhole them if they happen to 
make good squiggles on a piece of paper, oh, they're an artist. If they happen to know numbers pretty well, oh, they're a scientist. What happens is they go down this path really early on of science and art as if it's something different. All right? Was da Vinci a scientist or an artist? Was Galileo a scientist or an artist? What happened that over the last few years we started to create these words called art and science? I would argue that creativity does not know the word science and art. It's really independent. And where we have the struggle with innovation, green chemistry as a way of thinking different makes us rethink this. Think about it this way. Imagine I took a piano. Right? And I played a diminished seventh chord. Everyone would go, ooh. And then I would resolve it to a major seventh chord. And I would go, huh. You're not reacting to the major seventh chord. Had I not created the diminished seventh chord to create that tension, you wouldn't have responded to the nice sounding chord. Good music isn't all nice. You have a little bit of a tension, and then you release it. How do we make molecules? When we create molecules, we have to go through an activation energy to create that molecular tension that is resolved through the formation of the final product. Who would have ever thought that a musician and a chemist could sit down and compare notes about strategies of creativity? Okay. Breakthrough thing. Three weeks ago at the University of Virginia, this is the most amazing thing, like tears in my eyes, spent an hour. A professor at University of Virginia composed a five-piece ensemble of, of music titled Green Chemistry. He had a 36-piece jazz performance about green chemistry. And he and I sat for an hour and talked to the 250 people in the audience about the intersection between music and art and science and creativity and the difference between classical music and jazz and classical chemistry and improvisation and innovation. This is where the future is. We need to attract people and students that didn't think that they were part of the innovative technical world. If we're going to do things different, we need to have new eyes and new ideas. We need to, to, to pave new pathways. Think about this. I was talking to my father-in-law once. What do you do, John? And I go, oh, well, we make molecules. You know, say I take a molecule that has a bunch of oxygens on it and I want to react it. Well, sometimes it goes where I want, sometimes it goes where I don't want, and so, you know, sometimes I'll put on a protecting group to do that, and then what I do is I add this molecule, then I take this off, and I do this, and I try to explain it. He looks at it, huh. Well, he's a soccer coach. And he says, hey, here's the goaltender, here's the offensive players, here's the defensive players. And I go, ain't that weird? You know? All of a sudden, who would have thought that an athletic director and a, and a chemist would actually have commonality? That there are certain creative instincts that are actually saying, what are we doing to our society to keep pushing everybody apart? Saying, you do this and you do this. You do this. And, you, and, and instead of saying, if we want a truly sustainable society, it isn't having just people over here doing this and people over there doing this. But having places like Berkeley where you do it all, and you do it all together. That's where we need to go. So green chemistry is, <laughs> I love this one, say, oh, green chemistry is a set of handcuffs that slow productivity. All right? If it's a list-based process, yes, I agree. If it's an intuitive, innovative approach, uh-uh. My institute has been in business for 36 months. First six or seven months it took for us to get up and going. In 30 months, we have filed 160 provisional patents. We have five products on the market, another five products on the way to market, and in history's worst economy, we're cash positive. Tell me green chemistry doesn't work. All right, and so we, it's obviously like a beautiful, wonderful scientist working with me. You know, I'm not going to do a commercial. Just give you a quick idea. If you want to go to the website, you can look at it. But you know, Janine Benyus, Paul Hawken, and I, we formed an organization to do ultra-low cost, non-toxic solar that's happening up here in, in Northern California. We've got, <laughs> this is me. I'm the grayest person in the institute. My hair is an experimental, non-toxic hair dye. <laughs> How about getting into your chemistry, you know? Um, but it's, it, if you went back, 30 years and took my hair and you took it now, you would not be able to tell the difference. If someone has black hair, this process makes their hair black. If someone has brown hair, it makes their hair. I found out how the molecules orient, how it can penetrate the hair shaft and orient them through non-covalent interactions to recreate the actual pigment in human hair. All right, we have, um, it's interesting, in, in, in Europe and in the United States, in Europe and the United States, you can use certain solvents for stripping photoresists in the electronics industry. Do you know that China banned NMP in photoresist stripping before the West? 
It might challenge your whole perception of the way the world works. And a company that sells to China their photoresist system, all of a sudden in big trouble if they can't use NMP. And so in three months, we invented an aqueous drinkable. Quality of life goes down the next day, but you could drink the solution. <laughs> uh, it's completely non-toxic. That again, looks at the intermolecular forces in an almost a pseudo-enzymatic way to strip the, to strip the photoresist. We have, we've, we've just gone into to, to high phase clinical trials, we've increased the oral bioavailability of a Parkinson's disease drug by a factor of 10. Now, if you think of the waste in manufacturing of a pharmaceutical and how much is excreted into the environment, by increasing your oral bioavailability by that kind of amount, you're talking a lot of saving of waste. All right, and so these are just examples that I would say, if I were to give a technical discussion about each of these projects, no one here would say, oh, that's green chemistry. <coughs> It doesn't look like green chemistry. It doesn't sound like at the molecular level, molecules don't know they're doing green chemistry. The challenge of technology, if it looks like, sounds like, smells like green chemistry, it's probably not. Solving problems is a chemical problem. If the outcome is sustainable, that's swell. But the two are somewhat dissociated. It's about performance and it's about cost. And it's just understanding what things have different implications. And so it's not that we're super geniuses. We're not super smart. But what we're doing is we're going to companies that have been working on projects for 10, 15 years. And what we're doing, we're not doing it any better. But because we're going through the lens of green chemistry, we're just doing it different. All right, and so what they've been doing for 15 years, we come in and we, we, we look like we're geniuses, but it's just because we're at a different starting point. Every one of my scientists, before they do any reaction in the lab, they fill out a form, 1 through 12. What I'm about to do, how does it fit principle 1, how does it fit principle 2? They make adjustments in that lens, and I swear it just puts us in a different innovative space. And so it allows us to be far more creative. So when someone says, oh, it's a bunch of handcuffs, <laughs> I just kind of, gig kind of giggle. But obviously I wouldn't be able to do it if I didn't have all these amazing people working in my lab. And so it's easy for me to get up here and babble. I, I really do think I've attracted some of the best and brightest scientists on the planet to come work with me. Um, and obviously I'm the luckiest person in the world to, to have all this happening. So that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to say to you and to close this, this discussion by, by pointing out that Berkeley has something really special here and that what, it, what makes chemistry great is what these people are doing here. What makes environmental health great is what these people are doing here. Recognize your individuality. Do what it is that you do and have always been doing and do some of it together but maintain your distance at the same time so that you're stronger as a sum instead of merging together and vanishing each other. Thank you.